uh, you know, good time with a fishing with this kind of rod. He said, you know, put in a backpack, you go, nobody know you have the fishing rod in hand. Oh, by the way, my first pocket ninja rod was shipping out two days ago, and it will be the first fish catch will be on the jungle of Amazon. So one of the one of the fish guy uh, here at Food Adventure Outdoor Adventure would would uh, guide people to the Amazon to catch a whole bunch of weird fish in here, piranhas and all these things, and would take my rod come over with the groups. We'll see. Well, congratulations to that. I would love to see a Tyrana <laughs> on a on a Tenkara. That's uh, yeah, a little insane to me. <laughs> well, the, the, my my last rod he has was he took my rod and to bring it to Amazon because he got Amazon and he tried to capture electric eel on a Tenkara. He got it on on my rod, Tenkara rod. He got it. I got a video of that. No he got way. it. And, and guess what? Guess what? He said catching the fish that was easy, but landing that electric eel that was a big mistake. Hey, what's up, everyone? John here from the Cast and Spirit Podcast, and today we have Luang Tam from Tenkara Tanuki. When he's not busy perfecting his skill of casting at the various casting clubs in Oakland, San Francisco, and Long Beach, he is working with his manufacturers in China to bring back the highest quality Tenkara rods. And in this podcast, it's actually a gem. He goes into what it takes to make a high quality product in China to bring it over for us. So without further ado, please welcome Luang Tam. Oh, my name is Luong Tam, and um, I love fishing when I was a kid. But before I go fishing, I was um, before I get into the fly fishing, I was just bait fisherman. And but I really like to. Oh, uh, when I was young, and um, I lived in Vietnam, and it was U.S. air raid in about the sixty in North Vietnam. I live in here, and so my parents is are from the city in Hanoi. So uh, they took me to the uh, countryside, and when I learned how to fish. And um, I cannot get along with the kids in there because they have to, the, the, the countryside kids, they have to work. And the only thing that I entertain myself is to go fishing. And so I start building my own fishing rod. And the problem, the fish I catch are very small. They only be like five or six inches or stream. So I begin to carve my own fishing, bamboo fishing rod. And so the rod band, and I should get into the rod band. To me, the rod band was fascinating for me when I was a kid. And I grow up into that. I come to America about the, the late 70s, and um, I was going to school and studying and get into uh, uh, design school, architecture school at Berkeley. And uh, one of the trips, we went to Nevada, and I saw a friend of mine, his name Gordon White. And uh, that was back in the 80s, and he cast and he had the grasshopper hopping on the stream. I was fascinated. So then um, I was introduced few years later, I was introduced into ten car, uh, into fly fishing and went to Montana um, in the 90s uh, to took my sons around the trip, Lewis and Clark. So we drove around the country. Um, so I, I stopped at the um, at Livingston, the, the uh, fly fishing museum, and they hand me two rods, two fly rods, and we just go out and we whip like a cowboy against the wind. It was fun. So uh, by the time... I got back to Bay Area, I got three fly rod in my car, uh, but I didn't catch anything. Most of the time, I just try to untangle my fishing line. So then we hired the instructors to teach us, both me and my sons, and then uh, we just get addicted to it. Uh, we really enjoy the fly fishing sport, and I caught a lot of fish, and oh, I love fishing a small stream, high mountain stream. Uh, although I live in Bay Area, we get a lot of big rivers around here, like the Yuba River. You can catch a big fish, but it's not uh, turned me on these big fish or lakes around here. I just like to go to the mountains. And my son and I, uh, we travel around every weekend. We just sit in the car and we try to cross the country. And we try from California um, and go to uh, Eastern Sierra. And then we end up in uh, the top of Vancouver Island. Um, so we just fish anytime we go uh, see the stream on the road and I always drove on the back row and we fish and we come back and the whole house spinning because we were driving too much. But anyway, uh, we fish every year I went to Yellowstone. So 2014, I went to Yellowstone and I run, ran into a, a fisherman there who used Tenkara rod and he handed me the rod and I started fishing it out and he talked and he is a salesman 
uh, he, no, he's a marketing manager for Honda in Denver, Colorado. Um, so he went travel to Japan um, every year. For, he stayed in Japan for three months, and he used this kind of rod and called a ten cutter rod, and he learned from Japan. And he fly fisherman, and he so he adopted. So he kind of using all his fly fishing experience to use the rod because of traveling. And uh, so he, in about 2000 or sometime like that, he totally dropped off. He doesn't use, uh, he didn't use the, uh, he stopped using fly rod and he just started to fish with 10 color rod because he thinks it's a more effective way of fishing. And so every year he went to Yellowstone for three weeks and fishing in Yellowstone. Um, so I met him there and he taught me a little bit. And I come back and I go into the internet and uh, just get my first 10 color rod and I really love it. I caught so much fish on that day. Uh, my first trip in California, they call it a little lake called the Bomb Lakes. And in the winter, they they stock a lot of fish. And also, it's colder water. And the fish move close to shore. So we just, I don't know, but I got um, I got about 100 fish uh, on the way back. And my hand hurt so much uh, because I did not know how to use the rod properly. And, my, and it was kind of dangerous to throw to the a mountain. Um, so then uh, I come back I, and then I somehow I get upset about 10 cutter rod, make story long to short, and I start building my own um, 10 cutter rod. Uh, initially, just for myself because I'm a software engineer, I want to build something that I like uh, more flexible and easy to cast because I'm a member of, of casting clubs, uh, you know, Oakland Casting Club, Golden Gate Casting Club. Long Beach Casting Club and Pasadena Casting Club. I just like to hang around and watch people cast. I really enjoy watching people cast. Um, so, uh, uh, so casting is very, very important for me. And all this rod, and either I don't understand or about the ten cutter rods, or it doesn't fit myself. So I just start building the rod. And in about a uh, few months later, I get a prototype. It's come out with beautiful prototypes, and I get a. Uh, a Japanese fan of mine. Um, so he uh, he from Japan. He worked in Silicon Valley. He worked for this a uh, 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 camera company. He come over and I took him to the mountain and we fish. And he also into with a ten cutter rod and he's holding the rod and he just love it. He said, "Can I have one?" It's very rare for Japanese ask you to give him something or maybe never done that because he said your rod was just perfect and it's a wonderful rod. Uh, because I did not sell, so the only thing I can do is to give it to him. Uh, so I give it to him. So again, a little bit, I get a few rods, and I I I get uh, hired a guy from uh, Utah and go out fishing with it. And uh, he look at the rod. His name Eric Ostrander. It's a very wonderful guy. And he uh, took me uh, to the river, and he said, "Luan, can we? Uh, do you make the rod for for the committee to use for ten color committee? Because your rod is the best." Initially, I thought he was just nice to me. And then when he opened the back of his car, he got like 20, 30 rods behind his car. I was totally like, wow. So he said, I have every single rod in here. And but your rod is a dull rod. What made so, it? Uh, what makes uh, your rod? What were some of the modifications that you did? To, to well, my rod at the time I coming out, it was really light. Uh, it's because I'm not a big, strong guy. I'm a very small guy. A little bit more than 100 pounds. I move my mouse every day. So, you, know, you know, computer mouse so don't do anything. So with a casting with a very light rod, I only cast fly rod. I only use a six, uh, six foot three fly rod. So everything short and light. And so the ten cutter rod is like 12 foot long or longer. Uh, it it really a lot of torque onto your hand. So I designed the rod is much lighter and also easier to cast. Um, because my rod was casting with a very smaller line. Um, it, in in uh, in a ten cutter fisherman, they call a level line, a fluorocarbon level line. It is about a ten pound test. So the diameter is about like point eleven or something like for fly fishing. It's about like zero x tippet, and you try to cast that for about twelve to thirteen foot long of those line. So it, we'll talk about the line different, but anyway, so um, so that's when I got in. People love to cast that, and they, they Eric really love to do a lot of called nymphing. So it's perfect for that, and the rod is very sensitive. But I didn't understand much about the rod at the time. All I care about was easy to cast, 
and good for my hand. And I feel good when I land the fish, I want the, the rod bend, that's all I care. Um, initially, I designed just like that. I got no idea uh, what another rod, 10 cut of rods out there, how they look like, how they feel like. Except for my first one, it was kind of a little bit heavy for me. Uh, anyway, so um, I think it's a good thing to kind of just mention to some of the listeners that who aren't experienced with Tenkara. It's it's a form of it's a very simple form of a telescopic rod that's fairly long, no reel, and it's used you know pretty much just like fly fishing without a lot of the complications of having to deal with a longer line to cast. You can kind of just whip it out there yeah is there any other way to explain it if somebody's never seen it before yeah so 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 eric took me to uh, introduce me to the 10 cutter club that he run uh by a top japanese master his name is masami and uh, if if listener want to do uh, a, a 10 cutter fishing in a serious way and i highly recommend it to take that class uh it's based in utah once a year and masami is um uh, it's really wonderful. He make the whole ten cut of fishing into the total three different ball games. And I will explain this more technical side of it. But you bring into the total with a superior level. And Masami is um in Japan they call him is the number one and also the living legends of ten cut of fishermen. Um. So anyway, so if so, what is ten cut of rod? Is ten cut of fishing is uh, the word ten cut of, It depends on the interpretation, but. What the tenkara if uh, fishing here is based on a, a traditional Japanese fly fishing style, just a rod, the line, and a fly. Uh, it's no real. It's a very basic, just like the first basic fly fishing rod. Um, that's all you need. And the rod is very long and light, and the line is short, uh, about the full length of the rod. So it's a very effective way in, in Japan, commercial fishermen, and they try to catch the fish in a mountain stream uh, because it's not much, the line don't lie much on the water, so you can control the fly. And, and, and in that case, you capture more fish. Uh, I will explain about that a little bit. So, so in, in a 10 cutter fishing, uh, in, in fly fishing, when we go to fly fishing, we have a lot of gears and we have a lot of fly to choose exactly what fly we guess the fish is going to take. Uh, so we put a fly on, so we end up spending a lot of time to change the fly on the weaver. But in a 10 cut of fishing war, because the the rod is long and the line is short, so you call it, in America, we call it contact fishing, I mean the line, the rod, and the fly are contact directly to the fish. They is, it is not uh, water in between. So if we do fly fish, the line on the water, the water interfere with the line, so you don't feel the fish stick. With a ten cut of rod, that you don't put the line on the water so much, so you can feel the fish stick. So when you when the fish stick, you feel right away, and you set the hook quicker, so you get the fish right away. Um, also, you don't use the the, the the matching the fly, but you try to they call suggesting fly. So you make the fly move in the water to suggest to the fish that's the living insects. So the fish going to take it. So rather than to tell them, here I am a mayfly, I am a cat is flowing around, and it, it's just suggesting something movement, and it becomes a very effective way and catching thing. Um, for example, uh, I was used to be a fly when I do fly fishing, doing the they call the hatch. I mean, when all the insect hatch on the river, the fish coming up and target to the insect specific insect that they take that and they eat that, and um, that drives fishermen crazy because fishermen have to match with the fly and mimic the fly. But when I use this type of ten cutter technique and I have a little fly right into the area where the fish take and I tweak a little bit. And some of the fish doesn't mean they want to eat my bugs. It's just because they think that bug going to eat their food and they are attacking it. Hey, here you go. You got a fish because fish don't have hands. They just use their mouth and grab it and you set the hook to it. We think that the fish eating. But that's one of the theory that I believe in. But anyway, so it's a very simple. And like you said, it's a telescopic rod. And you can collapse it down. Very clean. Live in the car. Uh, the nice things about that is it, the fly fishing. I used to have the fly fishing. I have so many uh, rod in the car. So when I stop and sometimes I mess up. I don't remember what line will go into what rod. Um, so you mess up the whole system. And on the way back, and and you have to 
sort them all out. You spend a lot of time before you go and after you get back from the trip. And with a 10 cutter rod, it's there. Everything is in one set. It's, it just pull out and catch fish. And as long as the fish not more than 30 feet out, uh, everything, most of the time we catch the fish between 10 to 25 feet away from you. So to prove the theory is right, is today is very popular fishing. Uh, people use called the Euro nymphing. While the rod is only nine to 10 foot long and the line equal to the rod. So most of and people catch a lot of fish with that. So it does, it's not about the distance, how much you cover the water. It's about, you know, where the fish are. So for people who just learn about fishing, uh, this one is a perfect to learn about fishing. Uh, so I, one time I took my nephew, he never done fly fishing before. I took him to Yosemite. So I gave him the rod. I have two rods I gave to him. And while I'm trying to set up my line, 30 seconds later, he's screaming down the stream. He said, uncle, I got a fish. How quick is it? So it's a very simple way of doing things. And in a half an hour, he gets about like 11 fish or so. And since then, he thinks he's expert in fishing. He still think that way. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, uh, but the problem is, you know, he have to work. Uh, today, he have to work a lot. So uh, young people have to work a lot. They have to grow, you know, have to have the family. So it, it with these rods are really good for, you don't have to spend time to learn. You can just take the rod out. You just understand the basic and you get your kid going out and fish. The kid can do fly fishing too. And for kids, it's a lot more fun to do fly fishing than they do with the, the worm fishing because the activity going on, they can see the bug going and they can see the fish chase the, the, the bug and they get into it. Um, I think that's a bad, I wish I could know this before when I teach my son. My son was really good caster, a good fly tire, but he doesn't have patience to learn fishing because he was too young. But with this thing, he will love it. With a 10 cutter rod, I believe now he's, he's busy working, but he would just love it. So anyway, so it's very easy to learn and very easy to use. So that I get into that, but I get into the 10 cutter fishing, not about easy to learn. Uh, it's about, it's different way of fishing and I don't have to worry about much of casting and I have more control of the fly and it's to go down to the level um, to make me a better fisherman. Today, if I go back to my fly rod, I'm, I'm a million times better than I was with a fly rod because with a fly rod, I have to spend so much time to worry about gear, stepping on my line. Um, it's a very inconvenient way to fish. With a 10 cutter rod, it's a very convenient. Um, pop out, go out and fish, coming back, go away. And you don't have to remember. You don't have to go to casting pond and practice. You don't practice casting for a couple of months, you get rusty. So that is that is about this, this, this beautiful tool. And also the, the beautiful things about with the, this 10 cutter of fishing, it brings me more close to nature. Uh, because there's no wheel. So when I get the fish, and um, I have to learn how to land the fish, I have to learn a lot of things. Um, uh, I have to learn a lot of things because the, the rod is very long and bringing the fish to me. And sometimes you get a bigger fish and how you bring in the fish. So it doesn't have any wheel onto that. You you learn about fishing so quickly because you force you to learn because there's nothing for me to add on to distract me from fishing with this thing, it's really because there is nothing and I have to focus on fishing and also because nothing, it forced me to learn, to overcome many things. So in, in fly fishing, if I want to cast and and I put on indicator, so I want the, the live flowing out, in here I don't have indicator because I cannot cast indicator with my rod. So I have to rely on the line of feeling and um, there's a lot of things that I have to learn around. And, and it turned out it become very effective way in catching fish because the less you have, the more you can focus on. So you can focus more on fishing. So you spend more time and you develop uh, more about feeling. So when the fish take now, when I cast out, and sometimes you can catch the fish with your eye closed because you can feel the fish take and you set the hook. It's a really wonderful feeling that you don't have that on fly fishing. You don't have the feeling on fly fishing. And then also the, the one of the things that I really enjoy about this fishing is uh, because the, the rod itself doesn't have the wheel. 
and the line contact directly to the tip of the rod. So that make the rod is very, very sensitive. So I, I can feel the vibration, so I can tell the difference between my little insect hit the different up, not the whole different, but I hit the rocks. You can feel hitting the rocks. It's a little bit different than the fish take. Yeah, it's really fun. Yeah, I had a chance to do tenkara fishing and, and some fly fishing in Yosemite uh, for the first time in a long time. Uh, but I went in the backcountry for six days, and I barely used my fly rod just because the tenkara was so fast to be able to like find a spot, take it out, th- get your first cast in within a minute, if, if not less, and you were able to just sight, um, sight fish. And just, it was just so much more fun than having to, you know, set up your whole reel, get it, get it out, find the right spot where you can actually get a cast back and forth to get your line out. You know, you can be in really tight zones in a, in like a little stream or by a lake and just kind of flick out your line. And then it's just really fun. I, I love yes. it. I just love yes. it, to be honest. Yes. And, and that is just, we just talk about fishing, all right? Um, it's a very, the, uh, it, I'm here in, in Bay Area, here in Bay Area, we have so many fly fishing clubs and also casting clubs. And we have three casting clubs within the Bay Area. In my Oakland, you get two. San Francisco, you got a Golden Gate casting club. So anyway, so Chris Corish, who is probably the world's number one fly caster, you know, they have top five fly caster. Chris Corish was one of them. And then you get Steve Rachef, who's of, of course, it, right? It's nobody beat his record. He's 50 years, 50 year casting. Um, I mean, world champ. But Chris casts a lot of good too, and he he produced a lot of wonderful, uh, wonderful students. One of them, uh, the most famous one right now, is called Maxine. She can cast. She's only 12 years old. She already get a national title. And then by the age 15, she get world champs. All right. So Chris know how to cast and when. Chris casting can cut a rod, and Chris and I are working right now eh, to figure the way how to use, to modernize the ways we learn how to casting. Because I spend a lot of time sitting on the casting pond and watch people to cast fly fly fishermen to cast, and especially the people who are new to casting. So when they go into new casting and they do some row cast, and then they go to call the they call the the, the fall cast. I call it an aerial cast, meaning the line don't touch the water. You just cast back and forth in the air. So one of these people who cast for like five minutes and they get the they get a hang of the tie loops and everything and then they start moving the line more line and ten minutes later they all match up because the line getting longer thing begin to get more loose con- you you lost the control of how to cast and you try to correct that instead of correcting how to cast properly and then you just keep making the things worse and worse and worse. So if you spend time on the pond or watching all your fan casting on the lawn, the back of the lawn, you will find that out. It's very easy to see. But so Chris introduced this kind of ten color casting. We developed the line, the water line, so that the caster get a certain length of the line, so you cannot get the line back and forth. So you just focus to catch it with the same length distance, and you cast, and you focus on the mechanic, how your how your arm movement, the movement of your arm, the casting strokes, just focus on that, the tie loop, and that's all. And it turned out people learn it so fast, learning this thing. So it's not only good for fishing, but it's also good to teach people how to cast. So that is the first level. But of course, the next level of, of I really want to introduce to the next level is about the presentation, how you get the fly land onto the water. Fly fishing, you cannot have that because... Um, Landing your fly fishing, the line is too heavy, touch the water right away, and then you let the fly land. But with this thing, you don't have the line touch the water. You only have the fly touch the water first. And it makes the casting, it just, it just totally, it bringing your casting level into a different level and different experience. So anyway, so uh, that's for a little bit higher levels of for people who really, really into this 10 cut of fishing. But other than that, you just put the line on, you go out and you fish. And you get a lot of fish. That's for sure. Do you do you see a substantial amount more fish if you can get the fly to hit first before the line? Like, is it like night and day different, or is it just like a, a marginal amount better? Well, I'm not sure it's day and night difference, but I'm sure that because the uh, 
because the light, the way you can hit the fly first, the fish will pay attention to your fly. Either they run away, you hit it wrong way, you hit it too, spark out too hard, they run away. But if you hit it just to fly enough, you know, now when people, the things about the tank cut of fishing, to me, it's not only about the fly hitting down first, it's about the accuracy. Because the line is so short, that easy for you to cast really pinpoint target a lot easier than with the fly rod. And the fly rod, when you cast it out, the line touches the water. The first thing you do, you know, swim, the water move the line away. And then you focus to control the line, not on the fish. So that is one thing that you don't catch the fish much. There is the time when you the, the line going first, is, or the fly going down first is very important. Uh, in fly fishing, they call tuck cast. That means you want the fly heading down first and then the line follow down. Tuck cast is for people who like to go for deeper for the um, for the name. So they want the, the name broken the, broke the surface and heading down before the line touch into the water. So they call it tuck cast. What you can do that we try for line too. And what you do is you cast the line out and then you raise the rod up. And so the line is going to move up and just have the fly hit down. Well, if it's not good, nobody would develop that kind of casting techniques. So with a 10 cutter rod, you don't have to do much on tuck cast. You cast it out, you, you just leave the rod alone and you control how, 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 how hard and how soft you want the, the thing getting down. But for nymphing, it's fantastic. It's just, you can get the lie, just the lie goes straight lie to the fish. And it, it doesn't have the lie on the water. So you can feel the fish take because the lie that goes, the lie contact directly to the rod. For lie fishing, you don't have the lie contact to the rod. Now, if you do the spin fishing, people who, who does spin lure fishing, you can see that when they spin out and they always have one hand to touch the line. And so when the fish take, the line will send will send them the signal that the fish take and they set the hook right away because uh, the line go to the to the eye so you don't the, the the rod doesn't feel much so the line is the first thing to feel with a ten cut of rod the line contact directly to the rod so uh, the sensitivity is very important to me because making the fishing rod feel more like a living object rather than just a stick and then also uh, make it more lively. That's what I meant. Um, also, it give you an ad additional called indicator. You know, so you can feel the fish take versus you rely on purely on the visual indicator, like the, the indicators or the bobbers or whatever it is. So anyway, so that give you another dimension. That's why people catching more fish with it. And also, if the line goes straight, the fish take you set the hook right away. You react a lot quicker. With a fly rod, sometimes the fish take by the time you set the hook. You spook every single fish between you and the fish before the lie get off the water. And it making a lot of noise, disturb the water surface. You spook every fish in between. And by the time the, the lie gets shaken out, the fish already spit the fly out. So you miss a lot of hooks um, with the fly rod. That makes a lot of sense. Now, do you stand, like, I know in Japan, there's some tenkara fishermen who only stick with one fly and believe that like you only need one fly? Do you have like one that you, you stick with most of the time or do you have a wide assortment? Well, not most people in Japan. Most people in Japan fish just like we are in here. Mm. Um, they are a school, uh, well, let me explain about a little bit. Now, if you do fly fishing, we have called the nymphing and then we have a nymphing rod, all right? In Japan, you so the nymph rod is the rod that you try to catch with a nymph only. So Tenkara is the rod designed to use for a, a more traditional a Japanese soft hackle style. And for the soft hackle, uh, they only, you only need one fly to catch the fish. But I believe more flies, you get more opportunity to catch the fish. But also the more fly you have, also the more problem you're going to get into because you get a tangle between the fly and the line. So that's also the problem with that. But with one fly, it doesn't mean one fly will be made up, catch more fish than two fly. I believe two fly catch more fish than one fly. I will explain to you it, uh, and here's what I believe into it. Uh, because fish are very lazy, right? So the fly have to go, they will pick up whatever closer to it. So um, they're not going to go out far out to get a better 
food. They just go right whatever close to them to eat. So if you get two fly and whatever flies a fly close to that fish, the fish will take it. So you got two fly, that means you get a chance to catch twice more fish. Not twice more fish, but tw you get a better chance to catch more fish than the fish take, then you get one fly. And uh, I have fish with, uh, when I started with my Sami, he not care about how many fish he catch. He only care about, he use one fly, how to fool the fish to take his fly. That's all he care about. Mm -hmm. And he he care about, he doesn't care about nymphing. He doesn't care about how many fish you're going to get. He doesn't care about big fish or what he care. I'm showing that fly out and if I want to fool the fish. If I got one fish a day, I'm happy. And he catch a lot of fish now. Yeah, so he can use fly, and, and over here we were we was fishing on the middle povo, um, or the lower povo, and you know when people is a tail water. So if you meet every fly, every fly fisherman up there on the povo river, they all catch with sign number eighteen, all right? Because a lot of the tail water you get a lot of small fly. Guess what? My Sammy used a sign number ten, and his fly look like he's huge. Soft hackle look like. Uh, stone fly and he catch fish he catch fish so interesting um yeah so it matching the fly is not important because the fish think that maybe the fish think that it's a stone fly they want to eat a stone fly and especially when you fish into the pocket water it's this amazingly wonderful experience and and when you get into this kind of fishing um most so speaking about catching more fish or less fish with a 10 cutter rod so uh you is you are most time you're fishing in Eastern Sierra, right? Mm -hmm. That's when the people from Southern California. Is. So I have um, one of my customer here who's belong to the cast, another casting belong to uh, called Grizzly Pig Casting Club. And he, um, he's retired, he's about 70 years old. And um, we go to one of the auction, we come in, I bid my first 10 cutter rod over here to donate to the club. And so nobody bid the rod because nobody know about the 10 cutter rod. So, David um, auctioned it and he got the rod and he took to Hard Creek and he get, he stayed in Hard Creek for every year. He stayed in Hard Creek for six weeks, uh, Hard Creek Ranch. And so he come over here and David also really good member. So he, he auctions a lot of stuff and he got a brand new orbits and everything. Um, so he went over there and uh, three months later, um, I met him and we were sitting out and chit chat and David said, Luang, uh, I really like to catching with a 10 cutter rod and I don't know what to do with the orbit that I, the orbit rod that I won at the, at the auction. He haven't used the rod two years now. He haven't opened the orbit rod out yet. He haven't used any fly rod he have. He said, I don't know what to do with all the fly rod. And he start, he start auction back the, the fly rod. And now he just using 10 cutter rod on hard quick. That's so funny. he said, a simple enough. He said the hard quick and he said it's totally different feeling. And then so he, he just like, you know, wonderful thing. He just go out and he want to get a longer rod and longer rod for me. And because now he get more confidence. And he said, it's so simple. Now he's 70 something. And he had so many years of fly fishing experience. He traveled around the world fish. And he, he right now he just said, you know what? I, I just use a 10 cutter rod, nice compact. It's, uh, it's a very compact, easy for me to travel around. And then I also have a customer from New York, a New Jersey. And he only fish with a 10 cutter rod and he belonged to fly fishing club in back east. So he really wanted to invite me to come over his club and talk, but he got a hard time over there because in East coast, people don't believe in 10 cutter fishing and some, they don't even mention that in a fly fishing club. So this is very strange. In the West coast, people are more open-minded. So people are more used. Um, but to me, the 10 cutter rods, uh, is going to be, um, going to be getting the popular. Uh, it's not about because it's easy to use, it's more convenience. To, to me, it's more about convenient to use. And also today, people don't have much time to learn. That you makes only, a lot of sense. Yeah, just, just go out and you fish. It. You know, you look at fly fishing and people practice when they were young. You get into fly fishing when you were young and then you have the family and then and then until your kid get out of college, then you're thinking about fly rod again. So that's about 20, 20 to 30 years gaps of fly fishing in between. Because fly fishing, then you have to go back and everything changes. It's very hassle to learn about it. With a 10 cutter rod, 
you still can have your family and you still can go out fishing. With a fly rod, it's almost like people get stuck with a family. They have rarely, t- they have very little time to go out fishing with. You see that. A lot of people go busy to work because they don't have time. But I think you're right okay. because it's just a mental barrier to get started, right? If you have to think about all the gear you have to get ready or the investment in the gear, and you're just like, when you can just buy a 10-car rod and it's basically, you know, relatively fixed cost and, and cheap, but you can be out and about in a weekend catching fish instead of yeah. having to you, do the research can, to find a reel, get a rod, get the right line. Is it a float line? Is it a sinking line? What kind of flies do I need? Do I have to have time to go to the park and practice or find a casting club? It's like that's 10 steps <laughs> when in a 10 car you can go online, buy a package, and, you know, be out on the water the You're next ready to day. Go, is that right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Right? So so here, here's a very wonderful thing. And, and a fan of mine who, um, oh, it, it was in, in uh, back in 2013 or so, the economy was a little bit slow at that time. So a fan of mine, he just quit the job. And so we are, no, it's not, it was about like 14, 2014, 2013. Yeah, 2014. So we just stopped and, and then we, um, uh, uh, so uh, he just got laid off. And so uh, it's about in September. So I took him to, um, uh, so we already planned everything. We planned to go to go to Yellowstone and uh, fishing on, the, on because after uh, Labor Day weekends, things begin to, cool down in, in Yellowstone National Park. So we went over there and we go to fly shop and to buy the fly. So we do one experiment, uh, especially he doesn't have work. So we say, hey, we have 20 bucks each of us to buy the fly for the day. And so you lose your fly, you have the luck and you buy more, you forget about your dinner. So we go out to fly shop and we say, we have 10 bucks to buy the fly. Just give us the fly that works. So we go to fly shop and they show us every single fly, and we just we only can buy two fly. So anyway, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, at the end of at the end of the shop, we get more than twenty dollars worth of fly because the fly shop. Oh, if this you don't eat, you try this. If that is, you're going to try this. And then finally, he tell us. He said, if nothing's working, you try this. You know what the pattern he gave it to us? Which one? He called the because same one worm. So we all laughing. You know, why do you just give me this thing one worm in the first place and tell me to buy everything else and tell everything else doesn't work? Then I, the last choice I used is saying one worm that will work. That's and then the guy said, "Oh, that's yeah, that's a cheating." So we all laugh and we walk it out. So anyway, so so why is it cheat in first place anyway? All right, why did you sing one worm in first place? So, but you go to all the shop. And they keep telling you to buy all the fly. At the end, they say, why are you just using this one? They point out it's the same one worm. But by the way, it's cheating. Wow. So when you buy nymph, my, when I buy nymph, my fan said, oh, that's a bait fish. <laughs> 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 so anyway, <laughs> so uh, you cannot beat this, all right? So fly fishermen get different ideas what fly going to be. So you use a nymph, you're also cheating too because that's a bait fish. And you buy saying one worm, it's a cheating. So anyway, so... The uh, the ten color fly ten color fishing is not relies on the flies much, and it just depends on uh, the fly manipulation. And I think that we'll have the fisher to focus on fishing and learn it what you have and to be sure it works. So in Japan, if they give you something and you do it and you cannot do it, it's your fault. If you get if you fish you don't catch the fish, it's your fault. It's got nothing to do with equipment. It's your fault. So that thing that people need to learn about that. So anyway, so that is, yeah, you're right. So fishing, we sometimes, we read too much. Um, and also the, the best way to sell to people is a scary tactic and to teach, to make the things more complicated, confuse customer, and then you sell to the customer. You scare them first and then you sell to them. Yeah, so, I can I can see that. Yeah, when you go into the fly shop, the first thing you need to do, oh, you know, it's a lot of bears out there. Yeah, yeah. So they can sell you a can of bear spray, all right? If yeah. you go to if you go to Montana, every fly shop carry bear spray, and be sure they always tell you to buy the bear bear spray. But before they do that, they scare you first. <laughs> it's too funny. So same thing with us. Uh, same thing with um, yeah, sure. They are one, you know, like get get chased by the bears in the wilderness. It's like you know, get hit by the lightning strike. So. 
Yeah, sure. I have been fly fishing for many years and solo fishing. And the last time, it was the very first time that I get into the accident. I fell down and I get knocked out. And lucky somebody spot me and call the ambulance. Uh, well, probably get more people get knocked out like me than to get chased by the bear. That's what. Wait, so how did you get knocked out? Um, I uh, I did the experiment. Um, I developed the rod uh, called uh, the pocket ninja. Uh-huh. Uh, it, it fit into the car glove compartment. It basically it was designed initially. It was designed for backpackers and travelers. and, and uh, it's it compact enough. It's only about thirteen inches, so make it fourteen inches. Um, so you can just put into your car glove compartment. So one time I was at Oakland Casting Club and we had out for lunch and friend of mine just like, oh, it's so convenient to use. Just right in the car glove compartment. So we would chit chat on the lunch and then we developed. So I did this experiment for about six weeks that I decided between the July and August to go fishing with that. So in July, I get a 20 day, started a 20 day fishing. Um, I try, I leave the rod in the car. I get, um, I get just, just, the, just one rod prototype, the rod at a time prototype, and the rod in the car, and that's it. Nothing else. E- everything in the car glove compartment. Um, you get that and get a spool, live spool, and fly. And the spool I have, and get a get a little compartment you can fit a fly on there, and that's it. So I throw, uh, I throw to the first thing you fish a golden trout. I went to golden trout wilderness and catch a bunch of golden trout, and then I throw down and I stop down. Uh, at Hot Quick and I catch uh, the rainbow. I got few rainbow and few browns. And I throw back to Bay Area. I go to Yosemite. I get a bunch of um, uh, what you call that, uh, the bookie. So I get I get golden, brown, rainbow, and bookie. So, and then I show up to Oregon and uh, I catch every stop I catch in between from Dunsmere all the way up to Oregon. Um, I catch a lot of fish on the road. They're not big because they're on the road. And then uh, I have to go to uh, Montana to Boy uh, Bozeman to keep the presentation there and clinic there. So I drove all the way up and stopped by Yellowstone National Park and fish and fish between um, Nevada's and Utah's and National Park. I love Yellowstone National Park. Get a bunch of fish. And the biggest fish I got on the trip was from uh, Yellowstone National Park. Uh, it was it was called the Iron Spring Creek and uh, it 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 run into the uh, fire hole and Iron Spring Creek is Spring Creek to the colder water. So right on the mouth of Iron Spring Creek and the uh, Yellowstone River, the one side is a hot water and one side is a warmer water and one side is cooler water. So a lot of fish over there and a lot of insects. There's a lot of big fish there. So I caught a bunch of big fish over there. And then I went out to, uh, to Montana and fish. And you can imagine that I got some of the video on YouTube that within like two minutes, I catch four fish. I just stop my car and I go down. I tell people, here, I'm going to catch the fish before I put the, my feet on. Boom, I go down. I get, I get cutthroat. I get um, I get quite a number of different cutthroat uh, species. And of course, the browns and rainbows and do all this thing. And by the time I get back to Nevada, and that was the July 30th, and a little hill going down. And according to my video, I told people, here's my last hole. I'm going to fish. And that's it. And I was walking down. And normally, I can just say hopping down, right? And I just walking. And suddenly, I feel like I lose control. My feet, my feet start rolling downhill. And I think that I can move around quickly. But I did not know that I was in the car for 10 straight days and uh, fish a lot and stop and fish a lot and maybe not enough water or something. And suddenly like, I feel lose control and uh, I get up, I hear the noise. People who say, we call ambulance. So I was, I was fall down and I, I hit myself on the rock, the boulder right there. Oh man. And um, yeah, on the road. So people calling, somebody call out and they cannot call from, from, from where I fish. And they have to go 15 minutes drive down the out the canyon so they can make the phone call. So he said, well, you was falling down there and you're unconscious and you got a lot of bullets around you. So uh, that's what I know. And uh, But anyway, so, um, but uh, for that trip, for 21 days, I cast about a like thousand fish. That's crazy. Just, just park and see. Just park and no more, as long as I can see my car. I go down to the water, I can see my car. 
And you know, I, I walk on. I walk not farther than the farthest distance I walk is maybe like a football field or so. But most time I fish a bit and I just head back to the car, show up to the next pool out and just get down and fish uh, along the road. And and in Montana, there's there's a little quick call, meal quick or cheat. There's tons of uh, cattle you can catch as many as you want. Um, almost every single cast you get and in um, Dunsmere, I got a whole bunch of fish. I went down to Dunsmere and I catch fish and I run into four fly fishermen there and with me. And uh, we fish about like an hour when I come back um, and I got four fish and four of them, I talked with four, four of them, they're from Santa Rosa. I said, uh, you catch any? They said, we get zero. So um, the problem with fly fishing is because when you cast it out, especially pocket water, it, the line lay on the water. So the water, the current will take the lie away. So you make your presentation of the fly, what they call dragging. So that sometimes fish don't like it. Um, fish don't like things that moving kind of funny way. So they don't take it. So it takes experience of fly fishermen in order to control that fly because uh, you, basically you have to learn the water a lot. And so it takes time to learn. We can cut a rod the lie of the water. So you don't have to worry about it. Hundred percent. I think this is a good transition. Um, sounds like you've done a phenomenal amount of product development just for your, you know, line of of Tankara rods. I guess my question would be like, you have a background in in product development. Can you touch upon like what it's like to kind of like create a product in the fishing industry itself? Have you seen a lot of? Has it been difficult? Has it been relatively easy, straightforward? Do you know, we have a lot of competitor here uh, in fly fishing, but um, I get into the product development because I like it. My background is I'm also a product, uh, I was trained at architects and I'm also working a lot of uh, manufacturers. I'm working with the manufacturers since I was a kid because my mom also the factory worker. So I've been in the factories all my life and I know the, the process of development, especially in Asia. Uh, I know how to work with people, but anyway, um, so I really enjoy doing things that design, build, and uh, development for fly fishing in here. It, today we get so many products that who get the bigger voice, we get the most attention. But for me, I'm not worried about it. I'm just enjoy doing what I'm enjoying. And to me, the the product is developed. Casting is very important. So what I did was um, when I build my rod, I come over. As a matter of fact, it was really interesting that the 2000 um, I believe in 2016, I went to China to work in a factory uh, to build the rods. And uh, I broadcast directly onto Facebook. And we got a lot of group of people from Facebook who are watching onto it. So the first thing I come over to mainland China, it, I took my rods come over. They already did my first rod was really good. And we'll talk about how the rod development. It takes a lot of time. Uh, but first thing you have to develop called a communication. So you have to work with them. I very quickly, I have learned that none of them know how to do fly fishing. And here they are. They build all of this fly fishing rod for American market and European market. But none of them know how to cast. And I went over and, but just tell me what you want. We can do it. But they don't understand what we want. So I come over and I talk to them. First thing I come over and said, well, let's go fishing. You know, guess what? They have all this um, manufacturer, engineer, salesman, and the, the uh, product uh, development. So they all go fishing. So the next day they call me up. They picked me up early in the morning. They took me into the supermarket. And we know everybody in town. So they buy a whole bunch of food. You know, whatever food you want to get, it's really good food. They buy a whole bunch of food. They pack it down the cooler head to the car, so they take me into every fishing store over there, a uh, lie, a uh, fly, they don't have fly, but they go lie, lure, and finally they pull out a big cans of worm. They said, well, what bait you want to use for this thing? We're well, talking about 10 cut a rod and they bring out the, the baits, all right? I said, no, 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 we don't <laughs> use any of these things. We don't use any of these things. Um, so they want to be sure. I said, so what do you have? I just go with what the guy already built for me. So we I take them out and I said, you want to build my rod? You have to fish like the way I fish. So I teach them how to fish and cut a rod. So they cost fish. Everybody get cost fish today, and they love it. They said, we never fished like this before. You only fool the fish with a feather. You don't use anything else. No bait. I said, yeah, you don't bait. You no bait. So 
and go back and then they all sitting down and they learn how to tie the fly and everything and they learn how they get really into it and in china you work in china you don't have much vacation so you work 12 hours a day or 10 to 12 hours a day um, and then you work uh, six days a week you only get one day off and you get a family taking care of you get a kid to taking care of and once in a while you get a vacation so by the time I get back to America, so what you do on vacation, they all flirt me with all the picture of the fish. They said, we go fishing. We love 10 color fishing. So this year I went back to China. I developed called a pocket ninja rod. So I have to come back. At the time I was coming out with a new rod called ninja rod. And so we come back and they took me out fishing. Guess what? They out fished me with 10 color rod. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Yeah, it was like they outfished me. That was impossible. I said, wait a minute, I'm fishing in America more than you fish me. And they all laughed, but we know the water. Chinese food don't understand English. That's what they told me. <laughs> <laughs> they outfish me. So they outfish me. Like, so they really love into it. So now they, all the vacation they have, if they, the time, if they have any time, they go out fishing. I think that's so, huge. I have never really heard of somebody going to China and then making sure that they know the product inside and out by four you they know, know it. versus they just talking learn, about uh, it they have theory. to learn how to cast the way i cast they that's have to learn the way i amazing. cast and they have to learn everything like that yeah that's such a a genius move to be honest that's super well, cool um i am you know i see how people who are making the, the rods over here i mean like winston um mm-hmm. uh, i don't know about all this but winston and now uh, fanwicks and you know all of these even you know, six beer rods and sage and all of these on a great caster. All these rod makers are great it's Scots and they're all great caster in the old day. They're all great caster. They're all world champ caster. So if they, you know, I don't know about, they are good fisher, but I'm sure they're great caster. Right. Yeah. So the fishing is all about casting. It doesn't matter. If you spend 90% of your time, you cast and you only have 10% to catch that fish if you're good. Mm-hmm. So that means you cast out 10 times, you get one fish. So, so casting is a very important. Well, you know, with hand cutter rod, you cast a lot more than fly rod. So, um, because uh, you don't have the wheel to deal with it, so you're swinging a lot. You pick up the lie up the water, and then you, you bounce the fly right back right away. So, so here is one thing about. So that's I go to to talk about it. So I went to 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 mainland China to go to the manufacturer, learn about how they build the rod, and learn about. The most, most important I go over here is to feel things out when I went here is here's what I say and here's what you think. So how do you understand what I'm saying? So like, so to develop the communications, all right? Mm-hmm. So if I say the rod band that much, they have to understand on that side how much the rod band. So so this commit develop the first thing we work on the communication. So understand about communication. And the second thing I want to learn is how they build the rod. And when I'm design, if I know how you can build it, I can design that make you build better. And I am coming from in America. I used to making my own bamboo rod in America, sleep bamboo rod as a hobby. I come over and I talk to them and say, here's what we want. And here's the process I develop. And they said, wow, that's you. We make one rod you develop that way. But you want to make 20 rod the same thing you develop differently. So it's a lot of things that I learn from them and understand about it will help me to design better. And understand about the use of the material. It understands a lot of, about uh, the modern rod is about the use of the material. So, um, thing that I learned because it's like the high tech industries. The material you always have a new material coming out every year. So we have to understand about the material and how to use the material. So, so when you hire the manufacturer, I can share the secret. Is when you hire a manufacturer, you don't want to go into a very small shop. So you want to find a shop that can produce a lot of rods uh, for a number of reasons. The first thing that they have a better equipment and they have the better skilled worker. But more importantly, they also they use the material because when they buy the raw material, they use it right away so fast. You know, you go to busy restaurant, they get a lot of fast food, but you go to people who try to sell little food at a time, and sometimes you don't have enough fast food. So same thing, uh, my friend who make the, the rod over here, he have the cooler to store all this uh, carbon fiber in the cooler. In China, you don't have the cooler. So the material you have to use as quick as you can. So you leave it outside, couple months, you know, 
things are not so good. That makes sense. Yeah, so you have to use as quick as you can the material because right now they all they, they call the P page so they put all the epoxy onto the um, onto the seat already. Mm-hmm. So so you leave it out there, you get in contact with the air, you oxidate it. So so you want air in a temperature. So you want to use that material as quick as you can. So that's one thing that you know about that. And another thing, another thing that's a lot of process. So the the fabrics come on in. Basically, we use a fabric, carbon fabric. It come on in, so it come in a row of fabric. It's about a meter width, uh, one yard width, and then it longs about hundred meter. So, uh, so it come in the drum. So you the cylinder drum. So you use that. You roll it out and then you cut. And the process of what I have for people ask why tanuki rod is is a thin wall, lighter but it's stronger. All right. So the another process we have to develop is a very uh, painful experience. It not experience, but we have to iron that thing out, flatten it out. So you want to knock it out as much at, at micro wrinkle as you can. Uh, and those things are very difficult because you have to iron it in a certain temperature that just low enough and high enough, not melting the epoxy. So after you flatten it out as much as you can, and then you roll, you, you do a double row. So the first thing you do, pressure onto the, they, they, call, they have a metal um, iron and they pressure it. And that thing all now, they're all controlled by digital. So they uh, control pressure. So initially they go very slow and then they're increasing the pressure higher and higher. In the old days, you only get one shot. Now you can increase in that. So you increase the, the pressure. And then after that, you go to another row to stamp out as much as you can the, the air pocket inside, a little micro pocket. And then you wrap with the plastic right away. So the plastic wrapping it, hold everything together. And all of this process in between, you have to do it really, really quick. In America, we cannot do that because it's like assembly line. So start from rolling to finish rolling, it's on one shot. Uh, in America, when we do that, we iron, we put it on the side for a while, and then we, we roll it. So we don't have enough people in between to move things around. Um, and after that, and then they bake it uh, they bake it into the oven, the temperatures above boiling water at 240 degrees or something for four hours. So there's a lot of baking process going on, and then it's a lot of work. And, and today, a uh, few years ago when I come to – to the manufacturers, a lot of things done by hand. Uh, today, I come over, uh, a lot of them done by automated machine. And it was just in, in China, the rod making business is incredibly advanced. And it changed a lot. It changed um, because the towers come in there, they do nothing else but fishing rod. Um, so when I, I was there and I asked people, say, take me to the tackle shop so you can buy some of the fishing rod over there. You know what do they say to me? We don't have taco shops around here. That's interesting. So, uh, so I asked them, so well, you guys live next to the bay and the river. You get a lot of fish over here. And how do you make the... So they said, well, those shops are only for tourists. People here don't buy fishing rod. They only buy from the manufacturer because everybody knows everybody else making fishing rod. So you buy directly from the manufacturer. That's the way it works in China. So it's, it, it's amazing. It just it's amazing that you can throw the rocks down on the street, you hit at least ten rod makers. I can't even imagine <laughs> having that many. <laughs> in a row. That's, I know it's intense. It's a very high competition there. As soon as you so the so if you are making rods successfully and everybody in your family member become the rod makers, your relative, your your brother, your cousin, everybody become the rod makers and open the shop across the street and compete with you instantly. It's kind of a weird thing in China. Um, but the cool thing about it, that that everything they make in the same place, so if I make the rods, and it, it's so assembly line, so you make the rod, so the, the cap of the rod, you walk down the street, you hop into the bicycle or, or, or the moped, and you go down for about a few hundred yards, there is the manufacturers over there. They make nothing else but the rod cap. And then after you make the rod cap, and you chase them around, and they go down to another manufacturer. They do nothing else but oxidizing all of this cap to be sure. That, which is amazing. I guess so my question, stop, my yeah. question would be, how do you compete now with like even like if, if they're doing all that on the back end, on the manufacturing side of things, how do you compete on the front end when you come back here and you have you know 
some of the more established uh, Tenkara players who came in maybe a little bit earlier. And then you have like ones that can spin up really quickly if people go to China and just bring it over and white label it. How do you how do you stand out? What's what's your game plan on that? Well, I'm not going for the market to try to make billions of dollars. I'm being here. I enjoy the sport. If I want to make money, I stick with my own software business. Uh, I enjoy this bit, and I believe that the my rods, the people who love my rods, um, because of the quality and the performance of the rods and the worth of mouth to go into. I don't need too many people. All I need is just people who enjoy the product. I want the people who enjoy the fishing. And my rod design specifically is called trout fishermen. But you know what? My rod spread all around. And my rod, as a matter of fact, right now, for Kickstarter, I get three Chinese, three rods sold back to mainland China. Would you believe it or not? And the price from China, they can buy, I just told you, they can buy directly from the manufacturer in China. Why do they come to America? Because the rods are different. I get a lot of customers from Hong Kong. I get a lot of customers from outside U.S., the biggest customers from Taiwan. And I get a lot of customers from Italy. And uh, people, and of course, men, my customer are from uh, America. And I get a lot of customers from Colorado. And one of the customers said, he posted on Facebook, he just said, you know what? He, get, he said, one, you fish with Tanuki rods, you don't want to fish with any, any other rods. That's what he said. And he got a lot of rods. And he said, one, he's, because my rods are lighter and more responsive. And I uh, just let it grow by uh, organic. Just let it go. And uh, I, I did the project on Kickstarter. So more people buy. So knocking the price down a little bit. So uh, will help for my customer can buy the cheaper products. But other than that, um, we just take one step at a time. And I just focus on the quality and the rod will sell itself. I don't have to worry about it. Was it hard to to do? Sale. Was it hard to do the Kickstarter, or do you have it kind of dialed in now? Um, I'm just learning about it. Uh, everybody recommend me to do on Kickstarter, so can reach out for more people. So that's what I'm doing. And uh, do you know that the the it helped a lot, and uh, uh, in terms of get exposure, and uh, also help a lot to reduce to reduce the the cost. You know, Kickstarter does help. The pocket ninja rod is kind of a little bit different. I already put on to the productions already. And um, for the benefits of uh, my customer, so I put on the Kickstarter to so lower the price down because more people contribute the money and uh, will help me out on the, will reduce the production cost down. So it, it benefits for everyone. Yeah, the Kickstarter is great. Um, it's not easy to do. You probably make less money on Kickstarter than you sell one by one because a Kickstarter, you, um, it's like cooking. You have to a lot of preparation before you put into Kickstarter. So everybody think they should put the product onto Kickstarter and make billion is wrong. No, That's it's, a, it's hard. <laughs> it's yeah, hard, it's, it's hard first to get product it you fail. You think you make billion as you put it on, you put it on the Kickstarter. That's the first thing you fail because yeah. So so but. The Kickstarter helped me to get into some very good magazine. Um, like the last March I did was uh, the first rod I come out called uh, the Ninja Rod, Tanuki Ninja Rod. And uh, it was to go get into called the Yanko um, magazine, which only featured the best design products, international best design products. So I got into it. And uh, now they recognize my products, and then the Japanese also jump on in. They call the Axis also similar to Yanko's best design products, uh, but tailored for Japanese. Uh, well, actually around the world too, but mostly in architecture and focus very design. Um, that magazine fishermen don't read, all right? Because fishermen focus on the fish, not about the designing. But for me, the for me is it's a product design. It's a wonderful thing. And the Pocket Ninja is going to be a Yanko, uh, a Yanko uh, magazines again. Now my products are already in, and they really like my products a lot. And they're going to feature my products, uh, I think, December 18. So they are international. And then now they not only feature my product, but they want to do the social, uh, social media feed too. So they're going to put it onto Facebooks and Instagrams and everything. So it's a cool products. And they think that because it's convenient fishing, that's kind of, oh, well, I don't say, know. Kind congratulations of weird, kind of weird thing to hear. Yeah, thanks. It's kind of weird thing to do. It's a new way of fishing because even your car glove compartment make it easy, accessible for everyone and look cool design and it's great products. Um, so people who like 
the good products and and who really in, interest into the design, the look and feel, industrial design looking type of things, and they will like my rod. So I'm not going to chase or go after a different company. Um, I'm just in here and to set up. Here's what I like, and if you like. You know, if you cannot afford it, you cannot afford it. So, but to me, fishing is very important. Um, but you spend a lot of gas to go. Now, you from Southern California, so you know. So, it takes you about at least four hours to go to, uh, to go to the Owen River to fish, or not even the Owen Hard Creek to fish. All right, at yeah. least four hours. All right, or the lower Owen takes you about like four and a half hours. So, how much money you pay for the gas? You go and you catch the fish. How long do you hold on the fish? Thirty seconds. All right. You fight the fish for 30 seconds, you land the fish up, and you hold for a few seconds, take the picture, smile, and release it down. So you spend five hours, you're lucky you get a fish or two, all right? That's awesome. Well, the rod is not very expensive. Even my rod sells for $500. You're not fishing for one trip, it's used for a lifetime. And for that 30 seconds, for the time you spend on casting the rod, how it reacts to the fish, you feel the fish, it's worth more the money than the rod itself because, you know, the, the experience you get with a good rod, it gives you totally different feeling with you trying to cast with or not a good rod. So uh, I'm not sure it's a good rod or bad rod. I cannot say good rod or bad rod, but it, 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 if you if you give you a good experience, you will enjoy more. If don't give you a good experience, then your enjoyment is less. So it's like watching TV versus to go to the movie theater. It's a different experience. So fishing with my fishing rod, it's a totally different experience. So um, I, I took my rod into the fly shop and I want them to carry my rod. You know what do they say? What? We love your rod, but our customer don't know. They cannot tell the difference. And also another one cheaper. I said, well, because a lot of fly shop cannot even tell the different, the different rods and the bad rod because they don't have experience with these 10 cutter rod. So one, they, f- they fish a lot, then they will know the difference. That I'm makes not, sense. Yeah. And, and at the end of the day, too. You have to into the sport, too. If you're not into it, it doesn't make any difference. That's what I was about to say. Like They didn't start a Tenkara shop. They started a fly fishing shop, right? And I know that yeah. they're tangential to each other. But at the end of the day, it's like exactly what you said. You have to be passionate about something to be able to even convey it because you, you use it. So I think that's what the power of the Internet is going to be doing, though is that you, it allows you to get your message across and your enthusiasm and inspire people to try it. And then, you know, they can just buy it online and then go out yeah. and then post about all the good experiences that they're getting. Yes, it, 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 the product itself, um, they say I'm working very closely right now. I'm not going to make the one side fit all rods. So we are working on the next project right now. I'm working with uh, uh, another person. He's a doctor. His name is Robert Worthing. Uh, he's really, he also a fish guy. He also a doctor. He also a teacher. Uh, he can make tons of money in the medical field, but you know, he enjoy very popular in fly fishing community, uh, Tenkara community. He's excellent Tenkara fisherman. Um, experienced, he travel around the world, eager to learn new things and, and he expert into this Tenkara fishing. And, uh, and Rob and I, and also another person, his name Jeb Lumino, and he built nothing else but tournament fishing rod for the for the people who enter all this tournament. Um, so three of us co- work together to develop the rod that for specific purposes. So not one size fit all. So it doesn't mean design only can do certain kind of nymphing fishing rod, but we'll try to make the rod that can maximize of everything that we can so the fisherman can get a better experience and more productive. So that we're trying to do the rod, the new rod coming out for next year. So we still experiment stay. We, we took us about three and a half years right now. We're still working on it. It's take a lot of time to develop one rod. Yeah, but that's going to be time well spent for sure. Well, for the, yes. For yes. the joy of the people, also, honestly, right? It's better than just throwing out something that you're not standing behind. That's well, this, this, most of the rod you see out here is made from China. And... The Chinese, like I, like I, I discovered that they don't know anything about this fishing. All they have to do is just put a bait on that and go out fishing. So they cannot tell the difference between the good rod and the bad rod. When it comes to America, we feel good and we put the new label onto it and we put it out on the market. And we spend uh, $1 to make the rod and we spend $9 to market it. So uh, 
But I am the different. I spend nine dollar to make the bot and one dollar to market it. So that's a different thing. Right. right. Yeah. So the, of course, the one who who get more money on the market will sell more bot. But that's what they want to do. So different people want to do different things. So I just focus on that. I don't have too many customer, but just enough for me to make good enough bot for people can enjoy it. That's that's amazing. I guess my last question would be, and I ask this to everybody, is, and I know you've touched on different pieces of it throughout this whole conversation, but I just always like to ask um, fishermen, like, why why do you fish? Like, if you had to give an answer on, like, what what makes you still stay passionate about fishing itself, what, what would you say? I'm not sure. I just love to be out there and fish, and fishing something to me, like, maybe it's more connect to me when I was young, and something that I feel that... um. It's a, it's a different kind of experience. With the fly fishing, I really enjoy fly fishing because I feel that I fool the fish and I capture the fish and it's a magic moment that you try to release the fish and you feel it's, it, 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 the different feeling is a totally different. I cannot describe it. So um, I don't know how to say that, but it, the feeling of release the fish is really, really important for me. So you catch the fish and then I release the fish. The feeling release the fish like, Okay, do you go back and it, it's just I don't know. It's just it it just that experience. It's just like you are giving something. I got no idea, but it's kind of a very strange kind of feeling. Um, but now I have learned that that you know that in Asia you see a lot of monk in Asia mm-hmm. and they go out and they're begging for food everywhere. Yep. So initially I don't understand why these monks are so lazy. They can be working and they're making money. And it, it, it turned out that this monk doing this thing in the old day for one purpose, that to educate people about giving. So you give people something you feel good. It's not about them to go out and ask you for food. It's about them to ask you to keep something to make you feel good. So fishing, that like you release the fish, you feel good about it. It's a very strange kind of feeling. I have never heard of that perspective on, on the monk situation. I, I love that, to be honest. Because giving yeah. has been such ingrained in my, from my grandma, you know, she'd always say, give, give, give. And it took me a long time to understand that the act of giving is the, you know, one of the best feelings you can have. But yeah. to have it in that, a way where, you know, it's like, it's a difference in kind of, uh, what well, not enlightenment, but it's like most people would generally have the perspective of like, oh, that guy's a beggar. That guy has no value in society, yada, yada. But in reality, it's just, they haven't gotten to the, to the level of like, Oh, I should be giving because that's a better feeling. <laughs> it's better for society as a whole, and all these other things. That's crazy. Well, that. you think about that. That when 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 I remember that when I go down the street and some beggar, I give them quarter cent because I feel sorry about him. I give him, but after I give him dollars, and you feel a little bit different. You feel a little bit better for yourself. Either some people feel that they are feeling they are supported, and other people, but it doesn't matter what. You just feel better, and that to me is a, it's a positive energy. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank so, you. Uh, yes, yeah, so you go out fishing, you feel you get a fresh air up there, and uh, you catch the fish, you fool the fish, you release the fish, and you feel good about it. Are you primarily all catch and release? I all catch and release. I, I rarely eat, uh, eat my own fish, or maybe one or twice. Uh, I should have eat more because the play I go fishing. I should have eat more fish, I think. But I just I don't like eat fresh water fish. It's just cleaning the fish that I pan the neck. Yeah, <laughs> I grew up. I grew up uh, eating eating the trout in the backcountry, so it has a little different kind of place in my heart. But I, as I get older, I do tend to release more fish. Yeah, one. Uh, I know. I remember the first time I tried to release the fish, it was hard. But now I cannot see people keep the fish. I mean, it's hard feeling. But anyway, but that's just me. Absolutely. So, how can people uh, reach out to you or, or follow what you're what you're up to? Uh, do you know that uh, my uh, my website called uh, subscribe to my uh, website uh, called Tenkara Tanuki is two oh is one word uh, kind of long spell so I have to change the name somehow but the word Tenkara Tanuki dot com uh, subscribe to my blogs and once a while I put a blog but the best way to do is it contact directly me directly um, to Facebook Tenkara Tanuki on Facebook that when the most active and. Uh, a lot of uh, people who there, uh, who up there, and uh, normally people get the um, get the fresh ideas about uh, what I'm doing. And suddenly, like you know, I'm about to maybe next year I'm going to head to China again, and to develop some new product. And 
uh, this year I went out and I get sick. So I did not have much post, but normally I go down there and people over here, uh, they know right away what I'm doing for that day and what I'm eating and you know what I'm doing in the manufacturers. And I have all these things in life. And people, uh, it was so funny because a lot of rod makers come to me and tell me that we didn't even know how the rod was made. <laughs> And That's they sell rod, and they get no idea. They get no idea how to rod make because all they do is just, we just send them a label and they stick onto it. We got no idea, and then we spend the money go out. It's a very quick way of making money because you don't you don't have to spend a lot of time to learn how to make a rod, and you spend the talk about the rod that you have and. Um, yeah, so that's a different way of, of doing that. But I'm going there, and people like you know people love it. So, well, if you ever need company on one of these China trips, let me know. I'd love to uh, help video and capture some of this awesome yeah. uh, manufacturing yeah, process and go fishing out there. I've, I've never, I haven't been fishing out. I went in uh, Vietnam and Thailand this year, but I haven't done China yet. Yeah, we have um, we have one of the fly fishermen who uh, actually he indoor for different products, um, uh, different products. But when he hold my rod, it's compared to products. So when he hold my rod, he love it, and he would travel around the world with a with a similar to Park and Ninja. He said he love it. Uh, travel around the world with a short rod, and you go to Philippines and Malaysia and Southeast Asia, and well, he oh, had yeah. a good time with the fishing with this kind of rod. He said, you know, put it in a backpack, you go. Nobody know you have the fishing rod in hand. Oh, by the way, my first pocket ninja rod was shipping out two days ago, and it will be the first fish catch will be on the jungle of Amazon. So one of the one of the fish guy uh, here. It would adventure outdoor adventure would would uh, guide people to the Amazon to catch a whole bunch of weird fish in here, piranhas and all these things, and would take my rod come over with the groups. We'll see. Well, congratulations to that. I love to <laughs> I see a know. piranha on a on a tenkara. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, a little insane well, to the, me. <laughs> uh, my, my last rod he has was well, he took my rod and to bring it to Amazon because he guy Amazon and he tried to capture electric eel. And he got on it on, on my rod, Tenkara rod. He got it. I got a video of that. He got it. No way. And, and guess what? Guess what? He said catching the fish that was easy, but landing that electric eel that was a big mistake. Did he get shot? <laughs> he got shot. 80 volt shot. Oh, that's funny. Well, the rod was wet, and he put his hand on, you know, when we, when we go to boot camp, we, we told people how we had a big fish, you have to use two hands. He did just that for, for five foot electric eel. And the problem, is the the rod was wet, and it, it um, it is um, what you call is is carbon fiber. So it's it's like it electric conductors, right? It, it, it's yeah. gave him a shock right from the rod itself. So anyway, he got a fish. He said he won't do it again. What is it? you said? Eighty volts. What's the amps on that said, sucker? That's what he said. He says electric it'll average about eighty volts. And he said, but it comes down to amps to that would kill you, right? Like one amps at 80 volts would kill you. Yeah, uh, it's probably a lot less amperage. But that's crazy. And he thought, it's funny that he got shot. Yeah, he told me, you know, it was it was bad, isn't it? But his body somehow got it was stuck between two legs, even worse. <laughs> oh, jeez, that's a shock in the pants. I right know, there. but anyway, so you never know. So uh, he'll be back in about uh, half a month from now. We'll see. Um, hopefully he will bring some picture. Last time he took the rod out and um, uh, I'm not sure. He didn't catch any feet because it was raining. Oh, yeah, gotcha. we'll see. We'll see this time. Well, fingers crossed. Yeah, yeah. Fingers it, crossed it's a great for traveler. So it's a short, only 14 inches. So uh, only 13 inch uh, collapsed out to 13 inch. So it, it's really a compact rod to bring it out. Yeah. Well, that does it for this episode of the podcast. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I sure learned a lot. Thanks, Luong, for sharing with us your wisdom. And if you haven't already done so, please visit Apple Podcasts and leave me a comment with your favorite fish that you like to catch or that you're dreaming of catching. And lastly, if you could share this podcast with one of your friends, that would mean the world to me. Keep those lines tight, everyone. See ya.